lovely to be with you all this morning. Really looking forward to this morning's talk. So during our time together this morning, we're going to be thinking about the black presence in Britain. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently about black history, about black British history. There are quite a large number of publications um, available. A couple of things to say before we start is that larger questions around the exact size of the black community in the past uh, is often difficult to gauge, as indeed is calculation about any sector of the population before we have very robust censusing mechanisms in place. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some individuals who we can trace through existing documents, objects and images and use those individuals as a way to start opening up um, particular stories around the black presence in Britain. And we're looking here not only at people with an African heritage who were resident and living in Britain, but also people with an African heritage who are traveling to or through Britain, um, either from Europe, mainland Europe, or later on from the United States. And as with all our presentations, the objects we'll be looking at are British Museum objects. Uh, a lot of them are available through the Collections Online portal, which is on the British Museum website. There are a couple of objects which come from other collections and where they come up, I'll, I'll let you know about those. There's a couple we're using just to uh, fill in little holes in our collections. So uh, without further ado, let me get the PowerPoint up and we'll begin our talk together this morning. There we go. I'm also just going to pick up my pointer as I usually do. And welcome to our first two historical figures helping us to understand the black presence in Britain. And our first two figures come from the Roman period. And they're both objects in the British Museum collection and they come from a period in British history when Britain was part of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire, one of the largest ancient world empires, included territory in Europe, North Africa, and the Near East. And looking in particular at the Roman army, which is the background for both of our people here, the Roman army had a policy of stationing auxiliary units those were military units who are not legions, which is the term we often hear associated with the Roman army. So they're non-legionary troops raised in one of the provinces away from the heartland of the empire on the Italian peninsula. And they were stationed away from their homeland in a far distant province to avoid any local loyalties between garrison troops in forts and the local community. And that, therefore, auxiliary troops were posted across the empire, bringing people from across that empire to Britain. Now, our first Roman is a cavalry soldier. And this is a cavalry soldier from the Roman province of North Africa. We can see the figure has dreadlocks, a moustache and a beard. He wears a cloak, tunic, and boots. Um, his horse and part of his arm are missing, but we can still see he is holding his shield. Now, an altar inscription from Northern England shows that a unit from North Africa was stationed in Britain between AD 200 and AD 400, based at one of the forts on Hadrian's Wall, nowadays Burby Sands on the western end of Hadrian's Wall. And this unit was probably brought over by the emperor Septimus Severus, whose statue we see here to the right, and he was himself a North African. He was Roman emperor from AD 103 to 211, and he was born in the Roman province of North Africa. 
His mother, Flavia Pia, her ancestors had moved from Italy to North Africa. His father's family were North African. He grew up in North Africa, where he spoke the local Punic language fluently. He was also educated in Latin and Greek, which were the two main administrative languages of the Roman Empire, although he is said to have spoken them both with a slight accent. Around 162, Severus moved to Rome. And after that, he continued to travel back to North Africa, where he continued to hold a number of public offices and also serve in the Roman army. And it was this army that gave him the power base when he seized power in 193. As emperor, he traveled to Britain in 208 and he ordered the strengthening of Hadrian's Wall and the reoccupation of the Antinian Wall, which is further south in lowland Scotland. Then the next year in 209, he invaded Caledonia, modern Scotland, with an army of 50,000 troops. But his plans to extend the empire in Britain northwards were cut short when he fell ill in late 210. And he actually died in early 211 at York. So he died here in Britain and his body was taken back to Rome where he was buried in the mausoleum of Hadrian in Rome. So here from the British Museum collection, two examples of Romans with an African, in this case, a North African heritage present in Britain 2000 years ago. Now, the next person we're going to meet is from the Tudor period. And oh, let me just move my slide, there we go. And our next person is a gentleman called John Reasonable. He's possibly also known in documents as John Reason or Reasonable Blackmore. And he was a silk weaver living in Southwark, London in the late 1500s. And he's amongst the earliest known people of African heritage working as an independent business owner in London. He may have come from the Netherlands, which had a significant African population and a significant trade in silk. And it's likely that John settled in Southwark because the area did not fall under the jurisdiction of the city of London, where workers were subject to strict regulations and required to join guilds if they were going to trade. So in this print from the British Museum collections, we can see Southwark here in the foreground, across the other side of the Thames, heading towards the city of London. And the building we are particularly interested in is this church building in the foreground. And this is St. Saviour's Church. And our first records of John come from records dating to 1579, held by St. Saviour's Church, a church which was on the site of what is now Southwark Cathedral. And we know that by 1837, John had married. We don't know which African country John came from, but he lived in an area of London where many of the silk weavers had come over from the Netherlands. Many people of African heritage moved to the Netherlands due to its relationship with Spain, the Spanish Netherlands, and Spain actively traded enslaved people and ruled over the Netherlands at this time. Now it's not unknown for enslaved people to be freed in the Netherlands and had John been a slave this is what might have happened to him. The revolt of the Netherlands which eventually led to the Thirty Years War meant that 50,000 refugees fled to England between 1550 and 1585. This included silk workers and might explain how John ended up living in London. But there's currently no documentation to show his early life 
before he enters the records at St. Saviour's Church. Now, the next image we're going to look at helps us to understand a bit more about John's life once he was settled in London. And this map to the left shows at the bottom the area of Southwark where John would have been living. And it also shows St Olaf's Church, a church built on the bank of the River Thames in Saxon time. It was demolished in 1926 and the site is now St Olaf's House, which is part of London Bridge Hospital. Now, John had at least three children and at least one of these, a son named Edward, was baptised at St Olaf's Church in 1587. And a fourth child with a similar surname was also baptised at St Olaf's. So he may have had four children whilst living in Southwark. Two of his children, Edmund and Jane, died of the plague in 1592, and they are buried in St Olaf's Churchyard on Tooley Street. Now, Tooley Street, which still exists in Southwark today, is a corruption of the name St Olaf's. And actually you can see here on this map that St Olaf's is written as St Tools. And this was then corrupted over time to Tooley Street. After the death of these children, there are no further known records of John. So we don't know whether he stayed in the area or whether he, his wife and his remaining children moved on again. What we do know is that silk was very fashionable during the late Tudor period. And this helps to give us a background as to why John moved from the Netherlands to London, either as a refugee or as an economic migrant, because we know that raw silk imports went up five times between 1560 and 1593, meaning that silk weavers in England had a very steady trade during this period. It's also been suggested that John might have made costumes for the theatres in the Southwark area. Now the Rose was the first playhouse to be situated in Bankside. It was built in 1587 and was the first purpose-built playhouse to stage a production of any of Shakespeare's plays. The Swan Place Playhouse opened nearby in 1596 and then in 1599 the famous Globe Theatre was built by William Shakespeare's own playing company. The original theatre was destroyed by fire, but was rebuilt in 1614. And we have a small detail from a larger print showing what the Globe Theatre might have looked like in the late Tudor, early Stuart period. What we also have in our collections is a Tudor hat. Because we know that silk was used in large quantities in a range of garments. So silk would not only have been used for elite clothing, where whole garments would have been created from silk, silk dresses, silk robes, silk capes, silk cloaks, but also silk was used in the manufacture of everyday items, such as this Tudor round cap. And it's knitted from wool, which has then been felted to give it a fine velvety nap, it has three lines of dark brown silk stitching underneath the rim, so inside the cap, which would have held a silk ribbon in place to give a definition to the lower section of the cap where it sat on the head. Now, the remaining silk is of a very high quality, and it's possible that this is the sort of hat that Tudor Londoners would have purchased and worn for special occasions such as going to church, high days or holidays. And it indicates that for someone like John Reasonable, there would have been steady work in London in the late Tudor time, producing raw silk, not only 
to be fabric in large pieces for garments. We know that Queen Elizabeth uh, was extremely fond of silk when she received her first set of silk stockings, uh, said that she was never going to go back to wearing woolen stockings again. Her silk stockings were so fine, uh, but also producing silk for lower end everyday items uh, not only in the form of silk fabric, but also silk ribbons, or as we see in this case, silk thread. There's no known surviving image of John Reasonable. Thus, we have to uh, trace his story through Tudor London and through the British Museum collections through a number of associated objects. For our next story, we are going to begin with Young Kingston who does have a surviving portrait in the British Museum collections. And we know that Kingston, who we can see sitting here to the right, worked as a domestic servant at Casbury House in Hertfordshire. And this was the county estate of the Earl of Essex. The house itself was demolished in 1927 and the surrounding parkland was turned into an open space for Watford and still exists as such today. Now, this particular drawing is dated to the 23rd of February, 1774, and shows Kingston in the kitchen of the now demolished house in conversation with the cook who sits at the center with a coachman dozing to the right. Now, they seem to be discussing from the text we can see below the print, who should go to attend a bill, a, sorry, a bell, which has been rung in the upper rooms. Two other names are mentioned, Polly and Molly, and they ha may have been other domestic servants. What we do know is that this is a very late night scene. We can see from the clock that we're into the early hours of the morning. Upstairs are still awake, and thus the servants downstairs also have to remain awake and ready to go when the bell rings. We have no other life story details for Kingston, apart from his portrait, which with a date and a location, enables to understand that part of his life was spent working as a domestic servant in Watford. But we can use this indication of the presence of people of African heritage in Britain at this time, uh, in this case in association with elite households, as a way into opening up our understanding of the life stories of other people of African heritage who are part of the Black presence in Britain at this time. And one example of this is a man called John Rippon, who worked for the Earls of Powys for more than 50 years. Now we know that at the time of his death, John was living in Woodcote, Hampshire. And in his will, he describes himself as a gentleman, suggesting that he was no longer employed by another person. And in the parish register for St. Simon and St. Jude's Church in the village Bramdean, where he lived and died, an entry for John's burial in December 1800 describes him as, open quotes, a black who had been more than 50 years in the service of the Earls of Powys, close quotes. Now this would put his time with the Earls from around 1750. And we know at this time, Henry Arthur Herbert, first Earl of Powys, lived at Powys Castle, Welshpool, Wales. And he was resident there from 1771 and then succeeded by his son, George, in 1772. So it is possible that for part of his time working for the Earls of Powys, John was based at Powys Castle. Now, before inheriting Powys, the first Earl had lived at Oakley Park near Ludlow in Shropshire, and the family also spent time in London. 
So it is possible that these two other locations were also places where John had resided and worked for the family. When large aristocratic families moved between different residences, they would often leave a skeleton staff at each residence and move the bulk of the household with the family to the house they were currently living in. Now in his will, which was written in March 1799, John left 63 pounds, which is just over 3,000 pounds in today's money, to his former fellow servants and others, as well as 71 pounds, over three and a half thousand pounds in today's money, to the poor of his parish in Hampshire. Now the gifts in John's will give us an interesting insight into his life working for the Earls of Powys. So for example, he gives out a sum of six pounds and six shillings to Joseph Saltridge, servant to the Earl of Powys, suggesting that Joseph worked alongside John, but when John retired, Joseph continued in service and is therefore listed in the will as a current servant. But perhaps the money may have been a way for him to either augment his income, save up for his own retirement, or become independent of the Earl's household. We'll find out a bit later someone who made that transition from an elite household to an independent trader. He also, in his will, leaves a sum of two pounds and two shillings to a number of former a servant colleagues, including Peggy Steadman, the housemaid, a Mrs. Patty Watkins, and also a number of gentlemen, an Anthony, two Samuels, a James and a Richard, who presumably all worked in the Earl's household. He also leaves the sum of one pound to Betty, the kitchen maid. And interestingly, he also leaves gifts to a poor family who live near Oxford Street in the city of London. He leaves them a sum of one pound, one shilling, left to a Mrs. Howell and her son, Joel Howell. And it's possible that he had met them or built up a connection with them, either because Mrs. Howell had been a member of the Earl's household or because he had come across them when he, John, was in London with the family. Now, also in his will, he leaves to Mr. Geoffrey Bridge, who's the executor of his will, and who is now the steward of the Earl of Powys, one gold mourning ring worth two guineas. And we see here on the right a selection of mourning rings dating from around 1800. And these would either be bought by members of the family when a member of the family passed away, or monies would be specifically left in a will, as they were with John Rippon, to enable someone to buy a mourning ring, often inscribed with the deceased's name, um, often inscribed with a symbol uh, for commemoration. We have a skull and crossbones. We have a couple of funerary urns, um, which the person would then wear in memory of the deceased. So Mr. Geoffrey Bridges would have purchased a ring such as this with the money left to him by John Rippon as a memorial to his former colleague in the household of the Earl of Powys. The documentation from his will is the greatest insight we have into John Rippon's life and there is currently no further information uh, giving exact details of his time in the household of the Earl of Rippon, oh sorry, the Earl of Powys. However, if we move on to our next person captured in the British Museum collections, we can get an insight into someone who has taken that journey from domestic service to independent trader. And for our next 
biography, we're going to be looking at the life of Caesar Picton. Now, Caesar Picton, born around 1755, died around 1836, has a plaque in Kingston-upon-Thames. And this plaque commemorates the fact that Caesar Picton, having left domestic service, became a successful independent coal trader in the town of Kingston-upon-Thames in Surrey. As a small child, Caesar had been enslaved in Africa, most likely in Senegal, probably along with his mother, who did not survive the journey. He was transported to Britain by Captain John Parr, an English army officer. And we know that in November 1761, at the age of six, Caesar was gifted as a servant to Sir John Phillips, who lived at Norberton Place near Kingston-on-Thames. Now, Sir John Phillips was a British baronet and a member of Parliament. The young boy was baptised in December 1761 and given the name Caesar. He was also given three godparents, Elizabeth Cooper, Thomas Davis and Thomas Lewis. So some areas of Caesar's life we have a lot of information on. We also know that the three godparents were each gifted by Sir John the sum of seven shillings and sixpence, presumably to help them execute their duties as godparents. Now in June 1762, Caesar went to Picton Castle, Pembrokeshire, and for this journey, he was provided with a nine shilling pair of breeches by Peter Turnbull of Church Yard Row, Kingston. Now, Picton Castle was part of the family estates, although the family were not resident there and returned to Norberton on the 31st of October, 1762. And we can see here on the right, print from the British Museum collection dating to around 1776, so around the time that Caesar would have visited the house, showing the castle itself and some of the grounds. And his surname, Picton, was chosen by Caesar based on his time and his association with Picton Castle. Now Caesar probably began work as a page boy and continued to work in the Phillips household for many years. He learned to read and write and was trained as a senior domestic servant when he returned later on to Picton Castle from which he took his surname. Now what's also interesting is that as well as being based at Picton Castle for part of his training as a domestic servant, the location of the castle in Pembrokeshire was a significant coal mining region in Wales and the family itself had connections with this coal mining industry. Sir John died in 1764 and when his wife Elizabeth Phillips died later in 1788 she left Caesar the sum of £100. And at this point, he left the direct service of the Phillips family. He continued to work for Elizabeth Phillips after her husband, Sir John, died. And he used the £100 to set himself up as a coal merchant in Kingston. Norberton Place, where the family had lived, was sold. And the three unmarried Phillips daughters moved to Hampton Court. And they themselves, on their death also left Caesar not only capital, but also a series of annuities, a sum of money that was paid to him annually from their estate. This money meant that Caesar was able to expand his business and acquire premises in Kingston. Now in May 1787, the Society for the Abolition of the State Slave Trade had been founded. And signatories of petitions and letters concerning the slave trade 
reveal a number of black activists in London and elsewhere, but Caesar never seems to have been one of them. His signature is not present on any documents known about at the moment. Now, although he was not active, as we know, at the moment in the abolition movement, a letter from Horace Walpole, which he wrote from Strawberry Hill, dated the 19th of October 1788, gives us a small piece of evidence, a little insight into what Caesar might have thought of British interactions with Africa. I quote directly from Walpole's letter. As you will allow me to fill my letters with any scraps I can amass, I tell you how I was struck lately by a sentence spoken by a Negro. I was at Kingston with the sisters of Lord Milford, who are my relations, and who have latterly lost their very aged mother. They have a favourite black who has lived with them a great many years to amuse Lady Phillips under a long illness. They would read to her the account of the Pilu Islands. Someone happened to say we were sending or had just sent a ship there. The black who was in the room exclaimed, then there is an end of their happiness. What a satire on Europe. End of quote. Now, Caesar, with the money he had been left by the various members of the Phillips family, started his coal trading business at 52 High Street, Kingston, which he renamed Picton House. Now, initially, he rented the house, although he went on to buy it outright in 1795. He owned other properties, including a wharf on the River Thames, used for unloading coal with an associated malt house. And in 1807, he let out his Kingston properties and rented a house in Tolworth, perhaps marking his retirement from active trading at the age of 52. In 1816, he purchased a house with a large garden in Thames Ditton for the princely sum of £400. And he appears to have remained in contact with Lord Milford, who was Sir John's son, and acted as a witness to confirm the signature of two codicils at the time of Lord Milford's death in November 1823. Now, Caesar himself died on the 10th of June, 1836, aged 81, and he was buried in a vault at All Saints Church, Kingston a picture of which we have here on the screen. And his burial was recorded in the parish register, which you see below. He never married and he had no heirs. When he died, he left 16 of the mourning rings, examples of which we saw previously, to be purchased at the sum of no more than five pounds each for certain named friends. His main bequest was to his own goddaughter, Sarah Pinner. In the will, she was granted Picton House, and items in the will included a horse and carriage, a tortoiseshell tea chest with a silver caddy spoon, two watches with gold chains, gold ring rings, shirt pins, and a number of paintings. Now, interestingly, one of these paintings is listed at a, as a portrait of Caesar himself, and he left the portrait to his friend Thomas Bushel, but unfortunately its whereabouts is currently unknown. Both Caesar's former homes in Kingston and Thames Ditton now display commemorative plaques, and a meeting and reception room, the Picton Room, at Kingston University is named in his honour. And I'd like to finish the first half of our talk with Queen Charlotte. 
Queen Charlotte, Queen Consort, from her marriage to King George III on the 8th of September 1761 until her death in 1818. She was also Electress and later Queen of Hanover. Charlotte was a great patron of the arts and an amateur botanist who helped to expand Kew Gardens. George III and Charlotte had 15 children, 13 of whom survived to, child, to adulthood, including two future monarchs, George IV and William IV, as well as the Princess Royal, Charlotte, who was the mother of Queen Victoria. Now we have Queen Charlotte here in our examination of the black presence in Britain, because it has been suggested that Queen Charlotte was herself descended from a branch of the Portuguese royal family with maternal African heritage. Within her family line, this Portuguese branch of the royal family includes a lady called Margarita, and it is suggested that Margarita was a black African. However, other historians have questioned whether this ancestor, who was a number of generations back from Charlotte, would have presented a distinct enough connection for Charlotte to be considered black in any cultural way. Now, we look here at a print from the British Museum collection showing Queen Charlotte and also a portrait by the artist Alan Ramsey, which is currently held in the National Portrait Gallery. And arguments about whether Charlotte can be said to have an African heritage have been based around her appearance in portraits and also comments about her appearance made by courtiers at the time and she is indeed listed amongst the 100 great British Britons in the similarly titled book by Patrick Vernon and Dr Angelina Osborne although any direct contact with a well-documented and easily associated African heritage or ancestor is currently not available for Queen Charlotte. So sometimes you will see her listed as a great Black Britain, at other times she is not. I will leave it for you to muse upon. I will also move you into our 10 minute break. Time to have a comfort break, grab yourself a cup of coffee, uh, before we return to the second half of our break to continue looking at life stories from the British Museum collection which give us an understanding of the historic black presence in Britain. See you shortly. Hello and welcome back. We are going to continue in the second half with a number of British Museum objects which will help us to understand Black presence in Britain. And we are going to move now to France and to a gentleman called Joseph Boulogne, who was born in the French colony of Guadeloupe on the 25th of December, Christmas Day baby, 1745. His mother was from Senegal and his father was a French plantation owner. And we know that in 1753, Joseph and his father traveled to France where Joseph was in, enrolled in a boarding school. His father then returned to Guadeloupe. Two years later, Joseph, his father and his mother Nanon moved to an apartment in Paris and this was to remain Joseph's main home city for the remainder of his life. Joseph was a talented violinist um, he played the violin in public orchestras, and he also was a conductor and composed over 14 violin concertos. 
He was friends with the Duke d'Orléans, who employed him as a conductor, many of the public orchestras at this time being funded by aristocratic patrons. And we know that Queen Mary Antoinette also attended some of his concerts and invited Joseph to music sessions at Versailles, where he played his violin sonatas. Joseph was employed by the Duke of Orleans, during which time he was drawn into political activity around Philippe, who was the leader of the Orleanist party. And this really speaks to divisions within the French royal family before the revolution itself and opposition within the aristocracy to the absolute monarchy of Louis XVI. Now, Philippe was friends with the Prince of Wales, later George IV, and he sent Joseph to England in 1787 to meet the prince who he hoped would support his political ambitions in France. In London, Joseph stayed with fencing masters, Domenico Angelo and his son Henry, who he had met in Paris. They arranged exhibition matches for him, including one at Carlton House for the Prince of Wales. And we know that Joseph also met a number of abolitionists, abolitionists William Wilberforce, John Wilkes and Thomas Clarkson. Joseph portrait, a print of which we can see here on the screen, was painted by May the Brown in 1787, probably in London. May the Brown was an American painter whose subjects included British nobility and American political leaders. The painting was almost lost in 1788 when there was a fire at the fencing academy belonging to the Angelo family where the portrait was hanging. It was rescued and this print is based on an engraving by William Ward who lived around at the time when it was produced in the 1780s on Warren Place, Hampstead Road, and later Delancey Place, Camden Town. And this print was published in 1788. Also in the collections, we have a visiting card belonging to Joseph, who self-styled himself Joseph Boulogne Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Now the visiting card, also known as a calling card, is a small card used for social purposes. And before the 1700s, visitors making social calls would leave a handwritten note at the homes of their friends. But from the 1760s, spreading from the upper classes in France and Italy, the tradition of leaving a printed visiting card developed amongst the English aristocracy. The printing technology, as it advanced into the 1800s, allowed these to be produced uh, in large quantities and cheaply. And they were produced as personalized visiting cards to demonstrate social status. They're about the size of a modern business card and they usually carried the name of the owner and sometimes an address. And this one we can see here shows us that when Joseph was staying in London, he was a resident at Grenier's Hotel. Now calling cards were left at houses by an individual and the essential convention was that the first person would not expect the second person to allow them entry to their home unless they had first left a visiting card, almost as a, I would like to visit you note. This would then signal the beginning of communication and interaction, leading to a visit by the first person to the second person in their house. If a card was left with a turned corner, it indicated the card had been left in person rather than by a servant. And the whole procedure was dependent upon servants opening doors 
and receiving cards and was therefore confined to the social classes in London who employed servants. What we also see here to the right is a print of one of the most celebrated fencing matches of the 1700s, which took place on the 19th of April 1787 at Carlton House. And we see here Joseph in an exhibition match watched by members of the British nobility fighting the Chevalier de Ion who at this time in his her life was wearing female clothing and using the title of the Chevalier Dion. Joseph won the match and went on to perform other exhibition matches for the Prince and also at the Angelo's Fencing Academy in London. Now, while Joseph was away, the orchestras he had been playing with resumed performing in Paris, although unfortunately his position as conductor was passed to another musician. When Joseph returned to France, rather disillusioned at the loss of his position, he and a talented singer and his friend, the horn virtuoso Lamboff, embarked on a musical tour of Northern France. Joseph returned to London in 1789 and this time he also stayed with the Prince of Wales in Brighton and went horse racing in Newmarket. Now the next year in 17, no sorry, later in 1789, the fall of the Bastille started the French Revolution and on the 26th of August 1789 equal rights for all French people were declared. France also found itself in conflict with Austria, who were opposed to the revolution, and a revolutionary army was formed from volunteers. Lille, Joseph was now living in Lille, and he volunteered as one of the first of the newly formed National Guard and was appointed colonel of a new regiment commonly known as the Legion de Saint Georges, which was the first all black regiment in Europe. The new regiment unfortunately had problems obtaining funding, equipment, horses and troop training in the fervour of the revolutionary world. Uh, they were posted to the front line in Lille where they were engaged with combat against the 50,000 Austrian troops massed on the French border. After distinguished service in the Flanders campaign, which was an attempt by foreign armies to invade revolutionary France through Flanders, areas of modern Netherlands, uh, Joseph was arrested on charges of corruption and mismanagement of his regiment. Uh, he was then imprisoned for 13 months at the height of the revolutionary terror in the fortress of Hondeville on Ossi. He was never charged with any crimes and was released 13 months later. In the meanwhile, his post as colonel of his regiment, had been handed over to two other officers. Therefore, he lost his commission. He applied to rejoin the army, but his application was turned down. Now, news of the French Revolution had inspired a slave result, revolt in the French Caribbean colony of Saint Dominique, modern Haiti, led by Toussaint Louverture, two portraits of which we can see here. Now, no known lifetime portraits of Toussaint Louverture survive, and it's believed that these portraits may have been drawn based on descriptions 
of Leverture made during his lifetime. Joseph sailed to San Dominique to support the slave revolution against French colonial powers. However, he was disillusioned by the savagery of the conflict and returned to France. Back in Paris, he was appointed director of a new musical organization, the Circle of Harmony, which performed in the former Palais Royal. By now, Joseph was in poor health. The captain in St George's Legion, concerned about his old colonel's condition, stopped by Joseph's apartment and found him in declining health. He took him back to his own flat where he took care of him until Joseph died at the age of 53 on the 12th of June, 1799. Now, the slave revolt in Haiti led to the collapse of French colonial rule on the island. And the next person we meet is a Haitian Henri Christopher, who later became king of the newly established Kingdom of Haiti. Now, the portrait we see on the left is probably a portrait of Henri Christopher, and it's attributed to the British artist Richard Evans, who travelled to Haiti in September 1816 to take up position at the new school of drawing and painting set up by the king at his palace. Evans painted portraits of other members of the Haitian royal family, some of which were exhibited at the Royal Academy in London in 1818. The coin we see is a coin minted in Henry's name as King of Haiti. Henry himself was born in 1767, probably in Grenada, but perhaps St Kitts. He was the son of an enslaved mother and a freeman. Early in his life, he worked as an enslaved labourer on the French Caribbean island of Hispaniola, which nowadays is divided between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. He may have served with French forces as a drummer boy in a regiment which fought at the siege of Savannah during the American Revolutionary War. He seems to have gained his freedom from slavery as a young man and settled on the island of Hispaniola, where he arranged for his sister, Marie, to join him. Now, during the slave uprising of 1791, he rose to power fighting alongside Toussaint Louverture. The revolution led to independence from France in 1804, and he continued to work alongside the revolutionary forces on the island. Eventually, the island divided into two areas and Henri himself created a kingdom in the north, proclaiming himself Henry I, King of Haiti, on the 26th of March, 1811. He created the nobility and named his son, Jacques Victor Henri, as his heir. Now, under his policy, of forced labour, the Kingdom of Haiti earned revenue from agricultural production, primarily sugar. But the people of the Kingdom resented the continued use of forced labour to raise revenue for the Kingdom. He reached an agreement with Britain to respect its Caribbean colonies in exchange for British warnings of any French naval activity which might threaten Haiti. However, increasingly unpopular, ill, and fearing a coup against him by his subjects, Henri committed suicide in 1820. 
His heir, Jacques Victor, was assassinated 10 days later. And the general, Jean-Pierre Boyer, came to power. He reunited the two parts of Haiti and the kingdom of Haiti came to an end. Henri Christopher's descendants continue to live on Haiti. Pierre Nord Alex, who was the president of Haiti, 1902 to 1908, was Henri's grandson. And Michelle Bennett, first lady of Haiti, 1980 to 1986, was Henri's great, great, great granddaughter. Now on Henri's death, and the death of his heir by assassination, Henry's wife and his two daughters remained living in the royal palace in North Haiti. This is a portrait of the royal family showing Henry, his wife Mary Louise and one of their daughters painted around 1811 and currently held in a private collection. And to the right, we have a photograph of Mary Louise in later life. Now, Mary Louise, as wife of Henri, was a queen of Haiti from 1811 to 1820. She had been born in Haiti, where her father owned a hotel. And she met and married Henri in 1793. They had four children, two sons and two daughters. And on the creation of the Kingdom of Haiti, Mary Louise became queen. She was also given the position of regent should her young son succeed while still a minor. After the death of her husband in 1820, she and her daughters remained at the palace until escorted to a nearby property by supporters of her husband. Mary Louise was visited by the president, Jean-Pierre Bure, who assured her of his protection following the fall of the royal family. She didn't stay long in Haiti. In the autumn of 1821, she left Haiti with her daughters under the escort of the British Admiral Sir Home Popham and traveled to England. She and her daughters initially settled with the abolitionist Thomas Clarkson in Suffolk before travelling to London in 1822 where they lived in Blackheath, although the exact address in Blackheath is currently unknown. Late in 1822, they stayed at Exmouth Cottage in Hastings and then permanently left Britain to move to Pisa in Italy, where she spent the rest of her life dying in Italy on the 11th of March, 1851. The next life biography we're going to find out about moves us into the 20th century. And we are looking here at badges from the 1984 US presidential election campaign by Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson was an American political activist, Baptist minister and politician. And he was a candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1984 and again in 1988. He was born in South Carolina in 1941 and became active in local civil rights protests against the then segregated libraries, theatres and restaurants. And in 1965, he participated in the Selma to Montgomery marches, partly organised by Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders in Alabama. He founded the organization People United to Save Humanities in 1971 and worked to pressure politicians to improve economic opportunities for poor people of all races. He also was active as a negotiator in international events. 
including trips he made abroad, often to areas of military hostility, negotiating for release of both American and British individuals in hostile territories. On the 15th of February 2003, Jackson spoke in front of an estimated one million people in Hyde Park, London, at the culmination of anti-war demonstrations against the imminent invasion of Iraq by the US and the United Kingdom. And then in November 2004, he visited senior politicians and community activists in Northern Ireland. And in 2005, was enlisted as part of the United Kingdom's Operation Black Vote um, campaign to encourage more of Britain's ethnic minority communities to vote in political elections ahead of the 2005 general election. And this idea of political activism is continued with our next person, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, a South African anti-apartheid revolutionary and political leader who served as president of South Africa from 1994 to 1999. His government focused on dismantling the legacy of apartheid by tackling institutionalized racism and fostering racial reconciliation. Ideologically, Mandela was an African nationalist and socialist and he also served as president of the African National Congress Party from 1991 to 1997. And we can see here a badge in the British Museum collection, part of the political campaign for the first set of democratic elections in post-apartheid South Africa in which Nelson Mandela stood as a candidate for the presidential position. And we also see a piece of South African cloth, a type of indigo cotton fabric, which is decorated along the bottom with a series of photographs, which we can see here in detail to one side, of Nelson Mandela. This is a type of traditional South African cloth used in South African clothing. It's originally, it would have been dyed in indigo, although now it is available in a variety of colors. It's known from the 1840s, although this piece was produced in the 20th century. And it is mostly manufactured in a factory on the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela, having served as president of South Africa, went on to become an international spokesperson, political activist and equal rights activist. And we see him here in a visit to London in 2000, when he actually came to the British Museum. We can see him standing in the East Foyer, just outside the BP Lecture Theatre, which is the Nelson Mandela Lecture Theatre, which he opened at the British Museum in late 2000. And then next to it, we have a copy of what is known as the Robin Island Bible, which was a copy of the complete works of Shakespeare held in the library on Robben Island where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for many years. It was on exhibition as part of the Shakespeare exhibition at the British Museum in 2012 and includes annotations in the margin by Nelson Mandela himself. Our next item is an item from Brixton in London. It's a form of local currency known as the Brixton Pound, which feature a number of local well-known members of the Brixton community. And this five pound note features the portrait of the South Sudanese 
British, South Sudanese and British, former professional basketball player, Luel Dam. He is currently president of the South Sudan Basketball Federation. He also has played for the United Kingdom. He became a British citizen in 2006 after his family fled the fighting in South Sudan and has played for the Great Britain national team at the 2012 Olympics, where he acted as captain of the men's basketball team. He retains South Sudanese citizenship as well as his British citizenship, make him a dual citizen and he is well known apparently as an Arsenal fan and in 2020 he was included in the annual power list as the one of the most influential people in the UK of African stroke African Caribbean descent. And the final person we're going to meet today, again, has their portrait on textile. This is a dress from Africa produced in 2009, featuring a portrait of the then American president, Barack Obama, and his wife, who you can see here in the detail, Michelle Obama. And this is a full length cotton dress printed to mark the state visit by Barack and Michelle to Ghana in July 2009. Now, Michelle Robinson was born on the 17th of January 1964 in Chicago, Illinois. And having attended Princeton University, she worked in a number of law firms and also worked assisting people on legal aid, particularly around low income tenants. She went on to work in marketing and international intellectual property law at the Chicago law firm of Sedley and Austin and became the executive director of the Chicago office of public allies, encouraging young people to work on social issues. When her husband became president of the United States, she became first lady of the United States of America. And in that role, she, her two daughters and her husband visited the United Kingdom. And she later visited the United Kingdom by herself, touring London, visiting London schools, and speaking to students about international education for teenage girls and meeting the then British Prime Minister, David Cameron and Prince Harry. Michelle's memoirs, Becoming, were published in November 2018. And she also has a podcast, which started in July 2020 reflecting on her time as an advocate for women's rights and public education, and looking at her life as a lawyer, first lady of the United States, and a world traveler, including the visits to London. And we finish our talk today with Michelle Obama and move into the Q&A section at the end of our time together. So if anyone has any questions, Malcolm will be able to pick them up from the chat or the Q&A, and I am happy to talk about anything you would like to discuss following our talk this morning. Thank you, Catherine. The first question, um, earlier on you showed a picture uh, of a person in female clothing fencing. Can you just explain oh, yes. a bit more about that person? So, uh, what, 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 one of the, uh, someone didn't, didn't quite catch that bit. Oh, yes, now let me see if I can type their name for you into 
the chat. Let me just have a little look because then you can do a Google search on them. They are a fascinating person. They are a member of the French nobility who held the title of Chevalier. And what is known from their life story, evidence in writings of the time and also in images such as the one we saw as part of our talk, uh, they spent the earlier part of their life um, with a male identity, birth identity, and then later in life, self-identified as a woman, uh, wore woman's clothing, um, adopted a female version of their title. Uh, and as we saw in that portrait, by the time they were 60, uh, they were living full time with the female pronoun and self-identifying as a woman. Uh, and I'm going to find that name for you and put it into the chat uh, because there's a lot more information about them as a member of the LGBTP um, community and as a transgender person in Georgian England and also in France at the time. Yes, they are. They are a fascinating figure. Thank you. Um, um, I noticed you didn't include Shirley Chisholm in your in the US section. Is there a reason for that? So I didn't include who? Sorry, uh, second. Shirley uh, Chisholm, Chisholm, C H I S H O L M. Uh, yes, this is because the British Museum collections are eclectic to say the least. And the way that people find themselves in the collection is often through a circuitous route, such as the Brixton currency, which is collected as a form of money by the Department of Coins and Medals. And you'll remember in a previous talk about black history, uh, we had a portrait of Olive Morris, the activist, from a one pound Brixton note. So the stories that I am able to surface from the collection are usually stories where I can find a strong collection in the British Museum collections. And there are certain people, such as, for example, Mary Seacole, who I would love to have talked about. We have a large number of Florence Nightingale portraits. Nothing on Mary Seacole. I looked extensively through all the imagery we had for the Crimean War but could not find anything which hand on heart, I could say had a really clear link to Mary Seacole because her military establishment, which she was running un uh, under the title of a hotel rather than a hospital, uh, was further away from the battlefield. And we know that she went onto the battlefields themselves to tend to soldiers who had fallen on the battlefield but none of the imagery we have. We have quite a few watercolours done by soldiers in the Crimea at the time, um, but the link was always too tenuous. So your question is an interesting one because it's one I'm wrestling with the whole time when I'm looking through our archives and looking through the collections online, trying to find those associations so that I can give people an historically robust presence, some sort of link where we've got evidence in the museum collection that I can then in all good conscience link out perhaps to other archives um, such as um, Caesar Picton where Kingston have in their archives have got his, his burial records as part of the parish register so that's a very long answer to your very to the point question of why certain people don't appear in my talks. So what someone needs to do is to donate something with a picture of Mary Seacole on it to the British Museum and then I can include her. Uh, so uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the viewers says, I vaguely recall hearing that the remains of a man found in the Cheddar Gorge, that the DNA test showed that they would have had black skin. Is there uh, nothing in the museum collection about those remains? Yeah. No, that is another very good question and one which I uh, have been asked before. Those collection, um, that, that, that collection of bones was subject to scientific research, which is what the article and the information about the person's presumed skin colour are based on. Uh, there's two issues here. 
Um, one is that there are examples of black presence in Britain, which are held in other museum collections. And for example, York Museum have got a set of Roman human remains known as the Ivory Bangle Woman, where similarly work has been undertaken on the surviving bones, which strongly suggests that she is of African heritage in the same way that our, cavalier, uh, our cavalry soldier and Severus Septimus Severus have an African heritage and are part of the Roman Empire, but that's not held as part of our collection. Um, but there's a lot of information on York Museum website about that. Similarly with the Cheddar Gorge Bones, uh, that was a university research project, so we don't hold material related to that directly. Uh, the other thing is that the whole area of DNA research on ancient remains is an area where the word probably and likely and possibly have to be used a lot. Now this is not to take anything away from discussions about the diaspora of human beings from what is seen archaeologically as the, the cradle of, of the Homo sapien species in East Africa and its subsequent diaspora across the world. And linked to that, there are very interesting discussions about human biology as part of that diaspora. In essence, every single human being currently alive on this planet is the same species. We are all Homo sapien. Previous human species, such as Neanderthals, have all died out. Therefore, what scientists and archaeologists are continually um, trying to unpick and understand, people such as Chris Springer, who's to work at the Natural History Museum, is the story of human, not evolution, because we are a species and as such, we are the species who came from Africa, but changes within our biology and changes within our culture and our lifestyles that occurred over the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of years during that journey from Africa around the globe, and in our case, to Britain. And as part of that, there is a change in biology, which can be seen, which is fairer skin than Homo sapiens living in an African environment have. And the Cheddar Gorge bones talk to a point on that change in biology where people arriving in Britain had a biology which spoke more strongly to their immediate environmental heritage. Not their immediate species heritage, because we are all the same species. In effect, there is no such thing as different races. We are one species. And therefore, the work that's being done on the DNA of ancient bones tries to look at things such as where that person may have grown up, so where there may have been movement in their life, and where we can see markers in their DNA that allow us to understand what they would have looked like if we could reconstruct them. Because with ancient bones, you have a loss of tissue, you have a loss of skin, therefore you have a loss of all absolute information with regard to what that living person would have looked like beyond perhaps their sex, which is captured in the surviving bones due to shape and size of bones. So the Cheddar Gorge person is a fascinating piece of research. It's also probably, as you realize, has generated a lot of pushback from areas of the current human world who are opposed to this discussion. Um, it therefore has moved from an archeological discussion into a, a political and ideological discussion uh, I'm not sure I find that particularly helpful. I think what the scientists have been trying to do and the archaeologists have been trying to do is to set out a range of possible scenarios um, to then start interrogating them, looking for additional evidence, 
what they've said so far is that the DNA seems to suggest this. From an archaeological point of view, what we need is more evidence that moves that suggestion on to become a probably or a most likely. Um, I think I've probably gone a little bit away from your original question, which was, does the British Museum have any further information on Cheddar Gorge, which the short answer is no. The long answer is no, but it's absolutely fascinating. And it is fascinating because of the fact that this is where archaeology bumps headlong into politics and ideology. And often the discussions coming out of it tell you more about the views of the person commenting than about the evidence coming from the object, if, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and one more comment uh, that someone, someone said that there was a beachy head woman too, and she was a sub saharan Yes, yes, ex exactly the same. Human remains found beachy head down in Sussex, where again, work on the remains, um, which again are bones, because you've got a loss of, of, of skin and soft tissue and organs. The DNA that was able to be recovered from those remains suggested that the person had an African heritage. Um, and, oh, I do beg your pardon. Um, and again, the DNA allows us to track that person's immediate heritage and their possible that's my tablet buzzing at me I believe uh, and that person's possible movement around the world particularly where you have ancient empires because as soon as you have any empire you have a mechanism for people moving around so the driver for initial diasporas might be economic or lifestyle or hoping to move to another environment so the early farmers looking for farmland that they can farm and then you also have the opportunities for diasporas and people moving around through political structures which is where people like um, the ivory bangle lady come in uh, because she's moving through a political structure in the Roman Empire. But yes, Beachy Head is another good example. We don't have many of these remains in Britain. Our archaeology, our environment, our soil does not lend itself to human remains surviving um, for a, a, lo a long period of time. And this is one of the problems, is there are just not enough remains left to build up a really robust body of evidence and where remains have been found they're often partial uh, if they've been in the ground for thousands of years they're often in quite poor condition uh, DNA is quite easily contaminated and the current working is around the DNA that is recovered in the ear it used to be said that the best ancient DNA was found in a tooth because the enamel on a tooth is so hard that it protects the soft tissue and the DNA inside the tooth. Um, now researchers are looking at a tiny bone inside the ear, and one of these bones inside the ear is one of the hardest substances in the human, human body, sort of the human equivalent of diamond, and therefore the outside of that bone is very resilient in terms of protecting the DNA captured in the soft tissue inside the bone. And that is now the prime part of the human remains, if it survives, um, that researchers are working on to recover ancient DNA. DNA in long bones, such as limb bones, is usually very badly corrupted and does not give good results. Well, thank you, Catherine. I think that was a very thorough answer we got there. Thank you very much. Um, I think well, that, that brings to the end our talk today. Thank you very much. We are back next week. I hope to see you all then. Um, but, but, but from me, thank you very much. Um, and from Catherine, thank you very much. And I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. See you next Monday. Have a lovely week, everyone. Bye bye.